I love those words we just sang. He is the everlasting God. Um, as we wait upon him, it says we will increase in strength, not by my strength, but by his. And this brings us to our passage for the day because there's a, a feeling, there's a sense in me that our God has gotten too small. Maybe we need a bigger vision. Hear the word from Colossians. Today our passage for, comes to us from Colossians chapter 2, beginning with verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by empty philosophies and empty deceit according to the human traditions, that is, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Instead, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and all authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, and he forgave us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside as he nailed it to the cross. And there he disarmed the rulers and the authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Isn't that a great word this morning? Pray with me. Gracious Father, May our vision of you become bigger than the reality of our lives. These things that seem so big, when brought before the throne, seem very small, but not insignificant. Oh God, we give ourselves to you, not because we are small or insignificant, but because you are worthy of our worship. So today, may your word and this word, change our lives more and more into the image of Christ. For we pray it in that name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Didn't the band do a great job this morning? I, uh, I, two things I noticed. I always, especially when people switch positions, you know, it changes things up enough. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I really enjoyed Aaron standing over here. Sometimes he's over there and you really don't. We have two Aaron side by side. You're like, who are you talking about? <laughs> I'm, talking about I, I'm talking about Aaron with the beard. Oh, wait. I'm talking about Aaron with the... <laughs> right? <laughs> no, I, it, was, it was fun to watch Aaron sit, stand here because I miss him over here. And we pray every time before the service that the way we play our instruments would be an act of worship. I saw it today. In Aaron, I saw it in Melissa. I see it. All, I see it in in Lance. Of course, Joe's not here, and and Lynn, and and Lynn's up here just because she sometimes doesn't want to sit next to Kent. But, <laughs> but still, shh, still, Kent's like it's good. Yeah, no, she can be up there. Um, but uh, but I I'm so very thankful for what they bring every single week. And I was thinking about this especially today because so much of what we're talking about today has a heart of worship. And I want to get back to this, not like the Red, Matt Redman song, uh, coming back to the heart of worship, not like that. But I think our vision of God needs to change. I think our God has gotten very small. And I think maybe we need to see God as God is. These verses that I'm camping on today, we read a lot. And you know, in these passages in Colossians, they are so filled with meaning that we could take every verse and preach a sermon on it. So there's more I'm leaving out than what I'm including. And today where I want our eyes to focus is on verses 9, 8 and 9, but, but 9 and 10 in particular. It says, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily in Jesus. 
all of God dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him. Listen to the prepositions. I, I get hung up on prepositions a lot. And it's because I believe the English language hangs on prepositions. More than, more than we we give it, more than we give it credit. You know, if if I say, I'm in the car, as opposed to under the car, that implies two very different things, doesn't it? Right? The prepositions have changed. Or, or I'm in the car, or the car is on me. Right? Uh, something like that. Or I'm on the car, or the car is on me. Uh, prepositions uh, are are a big deal. And notice how this reads in here. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Notice it doesn't say, and you have been filled with him. You have been filled in him. I've used this analogy before, but let me use it one more time and we'll keep moving. But I want you to think for a moment of a five-gallon bucket. I oftentimes like, in this analogy, I like cutting the bottom of the bucket out just for the sake of the analogy. But I want you to take that five-gallon bucket and, and charter a boat off the coast of Guam, not far, but in the deepest part of the ocean, the Challenger Deep, Marianas Trench. I actually have a picture in my office of the Trieste the bathysphere that went to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. It, it was, it's, it's autographed by the commanding officer of that, that whole expedition. Um, I had a good friend who was actually a pilot at the time that this all happened, and he was circling in his, in his plane. He was circling, uh, doing recon, the whole time that that, that that bathysphere was under the water. He was circling, circling. They were waiting for a rescue of some kind. And everybody got these pictures of this Trieste, this, this uh, bathysphere, this submarine, but they were autographed by the commanding officer. I've got that in my office, one of my prized possessions, you might say. But I want you to go there to the, the Challenger Deep and to take that five-gallon bucket and reach down and scoop some of that ocean and bring it in. Is the ocean in the bucket? Well, sure, I guess to some extent. But there's more ocean than can be contained in the bucket. So it's not about the ocean getting in the bucket any more than it's about Jesus coming into your heart. You see the analogy? Instead, I want you to take that bucket in your mind, in your imagination, fill it with the water, and then let go. It will drop seven miles to the bottom, seven miles to the bottom of that deep. And now, is the ocean in the bucket? Well, yeah, I guess. But more to the point, the bucket is in the ocean. And this is the imagery we get. We've spent a lot of time talking about how to get Jesus into our hearts. When we get back to what worship really is, we recognize how big God is. And it's we who are in him. And is he in us? Well, yeah, the same way that the ocean is in a bucket. That's why I like cutting out the bottom of the bucket. Because as the currents come through, more of God is revealed. More of the ocean is revealed. That's the way my imagination works. But I want you to think about this because the prepositions matter. God is that big. Yet our God has gotten small. There is a poet back in the 80s who encapsulates the size of our God for me. Um, here's how the, the poet ri- writes these words. I bet you some of you, I bet some of you are going to recognize this poem. I believe you may have com- become familiar with it in 1987. I was 11. Here's what it says. I have climbed highest mountains... I have run through the fields only to be with you, only to be with you. Some of you are like, I know this poem. It's not Robert Burns. 
right? This is, it's not Robert Frost. This, I know this poem. Who is that? Um, I have crawled, I have run, I have crawled, I have scaled these city walls only to be with you. But, what is it, how's it go? But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. The poet, of course, was Bono. They may have put it to music um, called I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For in one of the greatest albums of all time, Joshua Tree, 1987, U2. Amazing, amazing. I wish I was there or more aware for that moment. What a great album. Um, uh, but, but here's what he's saying. It's kind of this move like King Solomon did in Scripture. You hear what he's saying? I've climbed highest mountains. I've run through the fields, I've run, I've crawled, I've scaled city walls only to be with you. But even trying all of this stuff, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. You remember Solomon? Ecclesiastes is the book. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity, meaningless, life is meaningless. So he runs this experiment with his life. He's king, he's the third king of Israel, and he's inherited a fairly stable government. King David, his father, did that through bloody conquest, handed him a fairly established um, nation. So, as a king, he has some of the recourse, some of the luxury um, to run an experiment with his life. And he, he recognizes there's something in his life that he's missing. Just not sure what it is. So he tries filling it with anything, with everything, with all things. He tries it with wealth and resources. And he talks about this. He accumulates uh, more wealth than anybody on, 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 on the earth. And, and he has more resources and all of this stuff is, at, is available to him. And he still says at the end of it, he says, my life is still just spit in the wind. Vapor. It's, it's like the morning fog that as quick as the sun comes out, it burns off, or a breeze comes in and it blows away. It's all meaningless. So he tries a different tact. If it's not material possessions, maybe it's relationships. Oh, and so Solomon collected relationships. 300 and some odd wives. That's not how you collect relationships. And, and for the record, he didn't just do those one at a time. Right? He had multiple at a time. Some of you are like, well, I'm monogamous. I just do it one at a time. Um, no, no. Um, 300, 300 wives, and on top of that, 600 concubines. Yeah, yeah. yeah. State-sanctioned mistresses is what that is. This was Solomon's life. And, and he collected all of these relationships, and still at the end of it, he says, it's all vanity. <sighs> You see, even the poets recognize this. You know, you can even believe the right things and still end up with that sense of emptiness. Right things. Here's the last verse to that poem, that song that I read earlier. You can believe right things and still miss it. Listen to what it says. I, I love these words. I believe in the kingdom come when all the colors will bleed into one. Isn't that a great imagery? Um, think of the rainbow, right? The prism that refracts the white light. Now follow it backward, that the kingdom of God, the kingdom come is all of the way that, that God's love has been refracted throughout creation, but it all comes back into that one light. And this is part of what it's saying. I believe in the kingdom come, when all the colors will bleed into one. But yes, I, he says, I'm still running. Hmm. You broke the bonds and you loosed the chains. You carried the cross of my shame. This is you two. Do you know that? This, we could sing this in church. You broke the bonds. You loosed the chains. You carried the cross of my shame. Of my shame. You know I believe it. And then what's the next line? But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. You can believe the right things. You can say the right things. You can even do the right things and still find out that there's a hollowness. We thirst. We are made to thirst. We are made to hunger. And there is something in us that is always desiring of something bigger than us. 
We're always looking for it. Everyone is looking for something, something that will satisfy, something that will fill, something that will satiate their hunger, their desire. We are always looking. Do you remember the story in John chapter 4? Jesus was going through the country of Samaria, the region of Samaria. And we know the story. Samaritans and Jews do not get along well together. They do not play or work well together. And the Jews are just as at fault as the Samaritans. It is a reciprocated relationship, especially in the biblical day and age. So don't paint the Jews as just, well... You know, they, those poor Jews, the Samaritans hated them. And don't, don't, make the Jews, uh, don't make the Jews heroes and don't make the Jews villains. Same thing with the Samaritans. Don't make them heroes, don't make them victims or villains in that. So it's, a, it, it's an equal, hey, Jesus is coming through Samaria. He probably shouldn't have done that. That was social protocol of the day was walk around Samaria. But Jesus and his disciples didn't do that. So they're coming through. It's about noon. It's midday. It's hot. And the sun is at its high point, and Jesus stops. He's thirsty. He stops at a well, a watering hole. And there's a woman there. Now, now the clues tell us. We don't really know much about her story. Sometimes we preachers pretend we know more than what we know. But some of the clues suggest that she may have been outcast even within her own society. Because you didn't go to the well at noon. That's when it was too hot. You went early in the morning, and you didn't go by yourself. You always did this in groups. That's why they put wells underneath parking lot lights, so you can always go safely in groups. Um, Same idea. You always go in in groups, and, and, and here was this woman by herself at a well in the middle of the day. The clues lead us to believe she may have been outcast within her own society. And now here's a woman who we find out has been married five times, has a long history of broken relationships. We don't know what those are. We dare not, whether we be preacher or commentator, we dare not write a story for her where we think we know what happened. We don't know. But there she was. There she was. Here's a woman who's had a long story of relationships sitting alone, with a single man who's never been married in the middle of the day, and he says, give me something to drink. He didn't have anything to draw water with. Excuse the preposition. I just said how important they are, and then I give you a lousy sentence like that. Um, And and so she's drawing water for him, and in the course of drawing the water, he makes a comment. They're chatting back and forth, and he makes a comment. If you only knew who was asking you for water, you would ask me for water, and I would give you water where you would never thirst again. (gasps) Sir, I want some of that water. If I drank some of that water, then I wouldn't need to come back here. That's what she says. I wouldn't need to keep coming to this watering hole. Now, of course, she's thinking about, I'm sure, the big vessels she was carrying or the, 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 however they were transporting water. But I think also with this is the middle-of-the-day social isolation stigma that she bore. If you gave me some of this water, it would satisfy me, and, and I wouldn't need to bear this shame one more day, one more time. Sir, do you have any of this water? course he was speaking of himself but we're always thirsting aren't we we're always looking everyone is looking for something something that will satisfy their life and it's that unsettled disquiet at the core of your life when no one is looking when no one is listening oh you can open your bibles you can say your prayers You can read your Facebook posts. You can listen to a sermon. You can do all of this stuff. And then when all of it fades, you're left with, it seems, a void. We all thirst. And we have been made to thirst. We have been made to hunger. The problem is our view of God has gotten so small 
that we substitute almost anything else other than God in our life. Which is really just a point of we've substituted God with me. All the things that we try, it's a reflection of me. It's what I like, it's what I want, it's what I desire. They're just reflections of me. We have become the God that we worship, and no wonder we feel hollow. I read an author this week who made the comment, I apologize, I don't remember where I read it or who said it, and I tried looking for it again, and I couldn't find it. So here's what they said, whoever they are, and if you know, let me know. They said, those who fill themselves only with themselves will remain empty. Oof. We live in a hollow culture, don't we? Emptiness. Um, The passage we read earlier, notice what he says. Um, Do not let anyone take you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Emptiness. We are filled with emptiness. We have have been filling ourselves with emptiness. Uh, I'll give you an example, a case in point. Now, this statistic is a little bit old, but I can't think that it's gotten any better. Um, So, you know, uh, we all carry our phones around, right? Phones, for some of you that don't know this, phones have not always been a phone as its least used function, (laughs) right? There was a time when phones were actually made, used to make phone calls. Now we use them for everything but phone calls. Um, And so there was a time when phones, get this, did not take pictures. Do you know that? (laughs) There was a time. I remember it. It wasn't that long ago. Um, But here's what the statistic, and this is several years old now, and like I said, I think it's gotten worse, and probably not better, but the statistic uh, of, of pictures being taken, okay? So here's how the statistic works. From the first generation of phones with cameras, phones with cameras, right? Not just the first flip phone you got or whatever, but the first, uh, the first uh, generation of phones with cameras, when that phone became mar- was saturated the market, Within the first year, we started taking more pictures every second than had been taken in all of history prior to the advent of that phone. If you add it all up, isn't that crazy? And 70% of those pictures, selfies. Every second. Every second, we are taking more selfies then all of the pictures that predate the phone with picture combo uh, in all of history combined. Isn't that remarkable? We have started worshiping maybe the wrong God. Now I can stand up here and tell you, well, you need to worship the right God. Well, duh, that's my job to tell you that. It's even kind of my job to do that. And not job like that's what I'm paid to do, but that's who I am. At least that's the desire uh, of who I want to be. Yet we still find this emptiness at times. And here's what I want us to compare it to. I think it's like our lives are like a sponge. And I don't care. Uh, you can, you can, right now some of you are thinking like a sponge in the ocean, a living organism, sponge. Some of you are thinking about that nasty thing that you wipe your countertops off with. Um, that, that, that collects microbes and bacteria and, and, and causes dysentery. It, it wasn't just your cooking, it was your cleaning. Um, so, uh, right? So I don't care which sponge you think of, whether it's the one in the ocean or the one by your sink, sponges have one capacity that, that, that makes them be what they are. They soak up whatever they're in. Whatever they're in. So, 
So if my sponge is in soapy water, my sponge, spo my sponge soaks up soapy water. If my sponge is in the ocean, my sponge soaks up ocean. It flows through, like my bucket at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Um, but if I take that sponge in the ocean, that living, breathing sponge in the ocean, and I put it in a septic tank, say. Now, that sponge will probably die. If it doesn't, it'll wish it had, <laughs> right? Um, but then if I pull that sponge out after being in the septic tank and I wring it out, what comes out is the environment it's been in. So here's the thing. When we talk about that emptiness in our life, life presents pressure, and our lives are like sponges. And when life squeezes, what comes out is an evidence of what's on the inside. So often we blame the circumstances for what comes out. It's wrong. I hate that. I hate that I'm saying that. Because I want to blame circumstances. I want to say, well, I responded that way because this, 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 and this. I, what I don't want to say is I responded this way because I'm a putt. Or I started worshiping my own ideas, my own opinions, my own sense of rightness. I don't want to say that. I'd rather it be other people's fault. But here's, here's what happens. When, when we crave something, when we thirst for something like a sponge, we will soak up whatever, whatever environment we are in. And, and when the environment we are in is one that worships things that are lesser than God, guess what? We will soak that up, and we will soak up a kind of emptiness. There was an art exhibit I saw some years ago that really impacted me. It was a temporary exhibit, and, and, and the exhibit itself made it, the nature of it made it uh, by nature temporary, but the exhibit was called The Presence of Absence. And of course, they had images of the victims of Vesuvius from Pompeii. Remember, you've seen them, these ghostly looking appearances that look like stone. They've been turned into some kind of hardened uh, form of the body where the body is gone. It was, it was consumed in the pyroclastic flow of that, that, that mountain blowing up and, and instantly wherever they were, whether they were running or shielding in their houses, whether they were old or young, they found some of mothers uh, huddling over their children. It, it, it locked them in that position. Their body bodies were consumed, but it was replaced by this mineral and this ash and this, this mud and heated and almost kiln-fired. And so what you have is the presence of something that's not there, the presence of absence. Some of you understand this if you've lost a loved one. The presence of their absence in your life echoes in every room with every phone call, every time you open a door, every time you hear a door open, it's the presence of absence. And sometimes that absence dominates our life, and this is what happens. We become, we thirst and we hunger and we, we want these things, and our lives are like sponges. And, 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 and so what we do is we will fill that void with anything we can find, whatever's closest. This is what worship is. I believe that this passage is about worship. I know it doesn't say it, and it doesn't give us how-tos, but I believe this passage is about worship because so often we think that worship is about what we sing, what we recite, Oh, this is all part of it, um, how we share in a meal together, um, how we gather, um, uh, how we listen to the radio throughout the week, how we respond to our coworkers, how we do our devotionals, how we pray. So often we think that's what worship is, and I'm here to tell you, I think worship is having a correct vision of that which is worth worshiping. If we saw God as God is, we would not have to contrive our worship. We would not have to worry about how empty our lives are. Just as this passage says, we have been filled in him. 
When we recognize that, something in us will change entirely. So this is about worship, and it's about seeing God as God and nothing less than God. This is why I love these words Uh, in verse 9. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. In him, in him, the whole fullness of deity, the whole fullness of divinity dwells bodily. It's not that Jesus looks like God. It's that God looks like Jesus. What does God look like? Remember, one of the disciples asked Jesus, show us the Father. And he says, how long have I been with you and you've still not gotten this? If you see me, you have seen the Father. God looks like Jesus. Oh, we spend a lot of time saying what God likes and doesn't like, how God would vote or not vote, what God would do and not do, what what God says and what God doesn't say. Here's the measure for all of our rhetoric is, does it look like Jesus? Does it sound like Jesus? Does it act like Jesus? Does Does it move like Jesus? All of the fullness of the deity, and earlier we read, some of you memorized, uh, was pleased to dwell in, in Jesus. And it's not like there was this person, Jesus, walking around, the first century a dude named Joshua, and then all of a sudden, God just filled him, and he's like, oh, wait, no, something's different. No, no, this was the God-man, full from the beginning of both humanity and and divinity, 100% full. And, and, and this is what this is the way, way our God looks. And you're like, well, that's great. I can get my head around this Jesus. Can you? I was watching a couple of programs this week on the, the, the James Webb telescope. Sorry, this stuff just fascinates me. And uh, I know, I know, I know, oh, we spent so much money. I know, I know, taxes and NASA, and they shouldn't get all this. I know, I know, I know. Allow me to just enjoy what I'm seeing. The images have come in. And one of the images in particular, it's not that great. It's not like you look at it and go, well, that's just a phenomenal picture. You know, it's not a nebula. It's not beautiful like that. But what's amazing about it is that The light that it is imaging took over 13 billion years to get here. Some of you are like, yep, great, go science. (laughs) Like, no, no, 13 billion years. Light travels at 186,000 miles a second. That's, That's over seven times around the earth at the equator in a second. Light travels that fast. And and traveling at 186,000 miles a second, it took over 13 billion years for it to reach Earth. (laughs) Like, I don't even know what that means. I I try to conceptualize it, and it literally gives me goosebumps. I, I get goosebumps by looking at these pictures because I recognize that God's bigger than that. God's bigger than that. And the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Christ. Bodily. Bodily. Did you see that? Bodily. Get rid of the notion in your mind that creation in you exists just to get rid of the flesh, get rid of the material creation and fly off to heaven somewhere over 13 billion light years away. Get rid of that idea. It's rubbish. It's not in the Bible. It is not what the Bible says at all all at all ever here's what it says is that god so thought that creation was good that he had said was good that he bound himself materially to creation all of the fullness of god was pleased to dwell bodily in christ if you hear nothing else god has sanctified your skin your bones and even this planet may we treat the things that he has given us as if God bodily inhabited the creation he created. 
May we steward it that well. See, this is what worship is about. We come back to this heart of worship. We need a bigger view of God. We have got to get a bigger view of God. So here's my definition for worship. It's not a way of getting you to worship the right things. How do you tell a sponge at the bottom of a septic tank, well, you just need to get to the ocean? Right? It's not about getting you to do the right things. It's about helping you to see how big God is. Because if we see this, then, then, then we won't have to try to work up what worship even looks like. We'll just worship. Think of all of the times throughout Scripture people have had visions sometimes of angels. The angels are so glorious, they had to actually say at times, don't worship me. <laughs> Think of the times, though, that there has been moments where God has appeared somehow. When Moses saw the burning bush, he was terrified, it said. When the Israelites saw the fire and, and the, the storm on the mountaintop, they were terrified. And it says in one point they worshipped. Did you know terror and worship go together? They really do. Not, not the terror like, like, like I'm going to get destroyed, but the terror of you could. <laughs> Twice without breaking a sweat. Right? It, it's that idea. Um, every time there is some kind of appearance of God, no one has to say, now worship. No one. In fact, at times they have to say, okay, not now. <laughs> it's the exact opposite. So our issue is not, what do I need to do to become a worshiper? The issue is, how do we see God? And then we'll worship. So here's my definition of worship. And it, it's a very narrow definition, and I get that, and we could expand it. And it, 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 it forgets more than it includes. But here's what I say worship is. Worship is the habit of offering sacrifices to something deemed more powerful than me. It's the habit. Worship is a habit. You're like, but I thought worship just flows out of us. Hmm. Sometimes life flows into us like a septic tank. Worship is a habit. Worship is, is the habit of seeing God as bigger than our circumstances, as seeing God as, as not, just, not just a benevolent deity way out there, but God who inhabited bodily, uh, bodily materialism, who is now oh, filling our life with his spirit in whom we rest, and he is now working through us. It's the habit of offering sacrifices to something deemed more powerful than my life. Uh, the key to worship is sacrifice. How do you know you're worshiping? You're sacrificing. Oh, we worship a lot of things, don't we? Some of you are like, well, I don't have any idols in my, I don't have any idols in my, my house. I don't have alcoves. I don't, I don't have idols. I don't worship. I don't light incense. I don't do stuff. You know, I, I'm not like that. Weird. I can worship just as easily with a bag of chips in my hands as I can in the sanctuary. And here's what I'm sacrificing when I open that bag of chips. I can sit there and eat one chip from the top to the bottom in one sitting. Some of you are like, oh, I can't never do that. Yeah, liar. Um, <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire. Right? Um, so here's what I know about chips. I know the salt content is going to mess up my day. Whether it's later that day or the next day going to mess it up. I'm going to need to take water pills. I'm going to need to take more Coreg because my blood pressure is going to rise. It's going to mess me up and it's going to mess me up for a while. And on top of that, I know that enough bags of those chips, remember habit, enough bags of those chips are going to put uh, unsaturated fats into, or is it saturated fats? I, I can't ever keep track of them. They're going to put these uh, bad fats into my valves and into my arteries and into my veins that are going to plug them and eventually uh, cause problems down the road. So what I'm sacrificing for the moment of joy 
that, that empty bag will finally give me. We're always waiting for the next one's always the moment of joy. The next one, it's always coming. It's always coming. And then when the bag is empty, you have just sacrificed what? For me, I've sacrificed my tomorrow, and I may have sacrificed my life. The habit. Now, I'm not saying it's bad to eat chips. I'm not saying it's bad to go out and buy something uh, that, that is just fun occasionally. That's, that's okay. I'm talking about the habits. These habits will define. It's like taking a sponge and wringing us out. It will define what we're worshiping. It will evidence it. And, and you don't get to live life without the pressure of being wrung out. Sorry, you just don't. Life stinks, and then you die. Life's not fair, and then you die. Um... And in the midst of this, what life will do is it will squeeze you and it will show what's in there. Worship is the habit of offering sacrifices to something deemed more powerful in my life. What are you sacrificing to? What is the most powerful thing in your life? Instead, a better option is to learn what it means to worship. And in order to do this, we look to God. Remember, Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. You see how he's comparing empty deceit with the fullness of God. He says, do not be taken, uh, do not be taken advantage of, do not be taken captive by these concepts of empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, um, and not according to Christ. Um, and so here's what he's saying. The issue is not so much what is in you. Oh, that needs dealt with. The issue is what or whom are you in? This is where our vision of God is, is, is meeting its fullness. We need a bigger vision of God. We need the surrender of God like a bucket dropping to the bottom of the Marianas Trench where God just fills and God is big and God is enormous. There is a moment of surrender in this. What does this look like in terms of our spiritual life? It, it comes with a lot of surrender. In fact, that's where it begins. Surrender is a kind of sacrifice where we're going to take our hands off because we recognize this stuff that life has been wringing out of me, it's killing me. It is killing me. And so we don't even try to wring ourselves out. We don't try to get rid of the excrement that has coursed through the sponge of our life. We don't try to do that. Instead, what we do is we, let it, we, we surrender it. And what happens is, is we find there is a transfer of location. We are moved from the sewage of the world, the stream of the world, into the ocean of God. And all of a sudden, we're filled with something new. <clears throat> Now, it may take some time. There's still remnants of that, that, that flotsam that has still made, made its residence in our life. It may take some time, but the first step is surrender. We surrender. We surrender our rights to be filled with anything less than God. We surrender. Here's the second step. We repeat. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I thought I had lost my salvation. That's a sin, maybe, of our denomination, that we have focused so much on the apostate, on walking away from our faith, that we've forgotten that there is a security in Christ. And I can't tell you how many times I came to an altar thinking, because some flotsam, because some remnants of that past life showed up how many times i came to that altar when life squeezed me and this appeared and i thought well i've lost it all i have to start from scratch and god here we go again forgive me of my sins that abc kind of prayer and 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 it's almost like the whole time god was saying no 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 quit starting over every time You've been squeezed just to reveal what's there. Instead of starting over, now that you see what's there, get a bigger, bigger vision of me. 
have a bigger vision of me. And this is the habit. This is the habit of worship. It's, it's, it's not coming back to that point, that, that salvation point where we keep saying to God, okay, God, save me again, save me again, save me again. No, it's surrendering. We surrender again and again and again. It's a daily thing. This is why Paul says, I am daily crucified with Christ. And then Galatians 2.20, therefore I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I am daily crucified with Christ. This is surrender. And when we surrender our right to, yeah, to the way our lives have absorbed the world in which we live, then what we will find is we are transplanted into an ocean of God's grace and mercy, his deep riches. And we are drowning in the love that he has for us. So today, the question is, what are you full of? <laughs> what are you full of? And it's a good question for us to ask because if we're honest enough to recognize when life squeezes, this is what comes out, then we can be honest enough to recognize I have been worshiping at the wrong altar. And all of a sudden, our view of God will expand. Here's what I want you to know about this God that we worship. As big as he is, as expansive as he is, as, as, as the whole universe is contained within God, and, and even as you are contained within the very person of God, as amazing as all of that is, he still loves you enough to die for you. He still, he still accepts you. Enough not to ignore the sin, not to ignore the flotsam of your life, but instead to deal with it. And he still calls by his grace to transform lives. I'll finish with this, and then we're going to sing a song together before we share in this communion meal. <coughs> Excuse me, but... I have found in my life I've grown so weary of another book, another sermon, another class, another video clip. I mean, this is good. I'm not saying, I, I'm not saying these things aren't a necessary and even a, a, a good part of my life, but I've grown so weary of more of the stuff and still not really experiencing the enormity of God. My prayer for you today has been my prayer for myself, that the gods of this world, the authorities, the principalities and powers, as he would refer to them in both Colossians and Ephesians, that they would be silenced. They would be silenced. And all of a sudden, the big God would show up in your life. That's what I want. I don't want just another sermon, more trans information. I want transformation. I want to encounter God in such a way that I can't help but worship. So today, that is my invitation to you. Do you know this, God? There is a point of surrender. We call this salvation. Uh, we call it initial sanctification. We call it justification. We've got all kinds of words to call it. Here's what it means. God, I'm done. <laughs> Let's take it all. Um, this is, some of you are at that point. Some of you too are like me and you're like, I, I'm just frustrated with all of it. I'm frustrated with, with going through all of the motions again and again and again. And I just want a vision of God. Oh, it's all throughout scripture. What's wrong with us? My prayer for you is that the gods of this world would be silenced and that the sanctifying God of grace would be so revealed to you that all of the excrement that has lodged itself in our life will become a past thing and God's grace will become the mercy that we drown in.